Hello, and happy Father's Day. I hope you've had a chance this morning to express some love and appreciation to your father if he's still living. You know, last Sunday, I asked you to share examples of how you are using your gifts, your creative gifts of hospitality. Well, Nita Heilman responded, and I just want to read her email to you. This is great. She says, good morning, Richard. As to examples of using our gifts for Christian hospitality, number one, the recent Operation Plant Drop comes to mind. I used my gifts of gardening, recycling, organization. Margaret and Emily also helped on organizing and getting as accurate a list as we could and designing the eight different delivery routes. Drivers included Ronnie um, uh, Nicholson and Melinda, Emily, Margaret, Nita, Phyllis, Robert Knightsky, Sue, Peggy, and Ashley printed out the uh, uh, lime green tags. Then number two, she said, the mowing ministry. For over 30 years, my daddy, along with Billy King, Bob Wynn, Shorty Moore, and Joe C., was involved in mowing, edging, trimming shrubs on our grounds. Today, we have a new uh, generation of folks doing the mowing ministry, a ministry of hospitality. I like to think of our church grounds as that big green welcome mat. Ryan and Rob Smith mow. Ryan usually does the big field. Robert Ott does the thankless job of push mowing the ditch and other areas that need to be push mowed. I push mow the front of the church and tend the garden and flower beds. Kitty C. trims the roses under the sign. Isn't that great? Using our gifts that God has given us. And that is a creative usage of, um, of, of her gifts and the folks mentioned in the email uh, to express hospitality to all of us and a welcoming hospitality to any of our guests. So thank you, Nita, for your willingness to be vulnerable in sharing your creative contribution to Christian hospitality. I also want to uh, thank the many of you for your financial support um, of the ongoing ministries of the St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. There's a growing number of you who are using our online giving platforms, and uh, I'm very appreciative of that. And of course, many of you continue to mail in your checks. Um, and so uh, we, we greatly appreciate that, so thank you. Welcome to today's worship experience. Today's theme is God works to redeem what humans mess up. The title of my teaching today is Creating Promise Out of Pain. I'm glad you're here.
Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from Genesis 21, verses 8 through 21. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman, woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named after you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away, and she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him in a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Words of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Now remember, today's theme is God works to redeem what humans mess up. We're looking at creating promise out of pain. A portion of that scripture that Margaret just read for us says, But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is though Isaac, <clears throat> it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named after you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. Hagar is a slave woman, an Egyptian slave woman. Hagar is a woman in a culture in which men rule. Hagar is a woman sexually used by another woman and her man to fulfill their dreams of having a child. Now, of course, Abraham and Sarah were within their legal and cultural rights to abuse Hagar in this way. But just because something is culturally acceptable doesn't mean it's right. Just because something is legal doesn't mean it's okay to participate in it. In fact, one should begin questioning the culture 
in which some things are cult culturally acceptable and legal. Now, Abraham's son, Ishmael, grows, and so does Hagar's status. Yes, she is still a slave, but her son will always be Abraham's firstborn son. But Hagar and Ishmael's status is not the only thing growing. Deep within Sarah, a resentment and hatred of Hagar and Ishmael are also growing. Through Sarah's eyes, Hagar is her slave, her property. And now she resents everything Hagar stands for. Never mind that at one time Hagar was abused by her and her husband. Now that this slave is gaining status, Sarah's attitude turns to resentment and hatred. Now look at what's going on here. A slave is used and abused by her owners. Now, first of all, people should never be owned by anyone. I don't even talk about owning my dog. She's a member of my family. I've adopted her, and she's a dog. People should never own people. Then, after Abraham and Sarah take their own pleasure at Hagar's expense, resentment, hatred, and prejudice begin to boil over. Isn't that interesting? After taking pleasure by using and abusing one of God's children from a different cultural background, a deep prejudice grows up within Sarah. Prejudice. Not a conviction of her own evil uh, perpetrating against a slave. Not her own admission of wrongdoing. Not her own God moment where she realizes this is so very wrong. But resentment and hatred and prejudice against the one who has been the recipient of her evil. Do our greatest evils always turn to resentment, hatred, and prejudice against the very ones we abuse? Shouldn't there be a conviction of our wrongdoing when we perpetrate evil against others? Is Sarah's story our story? Sarah banishes mother and child from the family home, sending them out into the wilderness. And we're told Abraham is distressed, upset, and disturbed by all of this. He is distressed, upset, and disturbed, but evidently not enough to put a stop to the continuing evil being played out. Is Abraham's story our story? For all of the slave's contribution to Abraham becoming perhaps the wealthiest person in the known world, what is her share of Abraham's wealth? A loaf of bread and a skin of water. Is this our story? Remember all those nice things that I said about Abraham being a man of hospitality last week? Well, I take it all back this week. <laughs> Abraham's complicity in this event is evil. Now, God recognized the evil plot being lived into by Abraham and Sarah, and God reveals a remarkable plan. God will make a covenant with Ishmael. God will make a great nation of Ishmael's descendants. Now notice, 
God will make this nation. It's the same covenant God has with Abraham's second son, Isaac. Just as God will make of Isaac's descendants a great nation, God will make of Ishmael's descendants a great nation. Is this the story of people of color in our nation? But things are not looking so good for Hagar and Ishmael at the moment. With the food and water gone, Hagar prepares for the death of Abraham's firstborn son, for the death of her son. And here then is this extraordinary thing. God appears to Hagar. God hears the cry of the child and the God who is attuned to the sound of human suffering responds with a promise of nation building and with a well from which they can drink. Abraham and Sarah were given the opportunity to do right by someone culturally different, someone they had already used and abused. They utterly failed. Is this our story? But God doesn't fail the slave <clears throat> who is set free to wander and die from the lack of resources after helping build someone else an empire. God hears the cry of the child. I want you to stop right there. Stop right there. Just, just stop. Do you realize, do you realize that I began this teaching exactly 8 minutes and 48 seconds ago. I want you to let that sink in. 8 minutes and 48 seconds until I said, stop, stop right there. I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine laying face down on the pavement with your hands cuffed behind your back, or imagine this was your son, or your brother, or your friend. Now let a full grown man kneel on your neck, his weight crushing tissue as you struggle to breathe for eight minutes and 48 seconds. Maybe white Americans need to reclaim the position of kneeling for prayer. And then maybe we need to get up off of our knees in prayer and do something about the systemic racism in our country. I can't breathe. Black lives matter. Well, in our story, things weren't going so well for Hagar either. After helping build someone else an empire, she is cast out with nothing to show but a loaf of bread and a skin of water left to die in the wilderness. But God hears the cry of the child and makes covenant to be the God of of this people. The presence of God is evident in relationship with all of the characters in today's story. There's a promise to an aging couple, a promise kept despite their fear and mistreatment of another. Because God is God, and God keeps God's promises. We also see God's care for the slave woman and her child. God's care for this family on the margins. The care that does not keep them in their circumstance, but responds to their changing circumstance. They are cast out, and God does not stop that action. But God meets them in the wilderness and provides a 
future and care in the present. We often wonder why there is suffering in the world, why God allows people to use and abuse other people, whether it's culturally acceptable or even legal. But God is ever present with those who suffer, those on the margins. And God creatively works to bring goodness and care even where we humans have brought distress and alienation. If this is our story, I want to side with God and partner with the creative way God desires to bring promise out of pain. I want to stop kneeling on George Floyd's neck. Now Hagar will go on to, to name God the one who sees. This God who sees is still watching the relationship between descendants of slave owners, beneficiaries of slave ownership, and the descendants of those slaves we all benefit from. Are God's grace and care large enough to heal our nation? Are we large enough to be healed by our God? Let us pray. All loving God, you have made every human your child, and you keep us all as the apple of your eye. Receive now from us the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. By our baptism, you have called us to be yours, baptized into Christ's death, we have renounced the spiritual forces of racism and other forms of wickedness and rejected the evil powers of this world. But we too often fail to walk in newness of life. Yet we know that you love even the sparrows. So how much more do you love us? Where we have failed to receive your gifts and treasure them, forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ. The great good news that has been poured into our hands is almost too wondrous to grasp. Loosen our tongues and make them bold by the power of your Holy Spirit that we may proclaim with joy your promise of the resurrection. You are the Savior of all those who seek refuge. Many of our brothers and sisters are feeling tracked down and hunted by the beasts of racism, disease, and distress. Comfort them by your compassion and let them see your face. 
Hear our just calls. Attend to our cries. Through Jesus the Lord. Amen. To the immigrant, to the incarcerated, to those injured by racism who wonder if their lives matter, to the poor and the destitute, God will show up as creative love and power even and especially to the least among us. To my white brothers and sisters, God longs to work through us as a reconciling force of love. Won't you be part of God's love?